Thank you all for coming. I'm just going to introduce you briefly to how I got started keeping bees and kind of where I'm at and then talk about the value of being in a group sometimes. Um, so when I was a kid, my dad lived on the Navajo Reservation and we, my brothers and I would go back and forth out to the reservation, get a couple of bulldozers, a travel trailer, a tool truck, and a bush plane, actually. So he could land, he could make his own runway, he could land really slow and, and short distances. But anyway, we, I as a teenager started hanging out with Navajo kids and I got in a fair amount of trouble, to be honest. And my mom got to where she didn't know what to do with me. And uh, she and my dad got together and they decided to ship me to a ranch in Colorado and I could herd sheep when I, when I was 14. And I had kind of long hair back in those days. <clears throat> you know, Native friends had long hair and I wasn't really in the hippie group so much, but, it, but I was, anyway, when I got to Colorado, they thought I was a hippie. And they tried to rope me and shear me and, you know, I was kind of traumatized. I came back to New Mexico after a couple of, I would go there in the summers and come back. And one day, my buddies, who wanted to help me spend all the money that I'd earned in Colorado, um, <clears throat> on various substances that probably we didn't need. And I was feeling like, you know, I'm tired of hitting my head with that brick. I'm just tired of that. And my grandpa came to me and he said, there's a swarm of bees out back. And I said, What's, what is a swarm of bees? And he said, well, I'll show you. My mom had gotten a beehive, but she never put bees in it. So it was just an empty box. And um, he said, let's put them in your mom's box. So I went back there and there was a basketball-sized swarm hanging in. It smelled really good and it just, it was buzzing lightly and there was a few bees flying off and some dancing going on. And I just stood there like, wow, this is amazing. And we took all the frames out of the box, cut the branch, put it carefully, you know, holding our breath, covered it. And I thought, wow, we, got, we didn't even get stung or anything. And I was carrying it and I could feel it buzzing and I just, something in me said, I gotta learn about this. I gotta do this. I am gonna. I want to keep bees. And my buddies drove up in their car, and they opened the door, and I could smell the stale beer and various kinds of smoke coming out of the car. And it was like it gave me the shivers. Like man, there's no way I'm getting in that car. There's not in my life. And I just smelled like death. I don't know how else to describe it, but it just felt terrible. And so they were saying, hey man, let's uh, let's go into Albuquerque and get, get some beer and stuff, and I said, no guys, I've got to go to the library and get a book about bees. When they realized what was in the box, they like, oh, okay. And they quick got in the car and drove away, and I was like, oh, that was easy. And I started keeping bees. And um, a couple years later, uh, my grandpa <clears throat> got really sick. He had cancer, and he was dying. And I had been to Colorado and came back, and I wasn't going back to Colorado. I kind of, uh, that's a whole long story, but anyway, I, I was going to stay in New Mexico. And um, my, I noticed that my grandpa had an iris patch, flowers, these iris flowers, all different kinds of colors of them, you know, and it was in full bloom. So I went to him in his bed and I said, Grandpa, your iris is in full bloom. I wonder if you could get out and go see it. Oh, okay. So he got in his walker and he was really frail. He got out there and he said, I think it needs more water. And I thought, I thought I watered it pretty good, but I'll bring the hose and... He was watering it, and I was by the hose bed waiting to turn it off. And we had put a, when I was a little kid, he and I had put a worm bed there, and we're raising earthworms, and feeding them melon rinds and stuff. And then a mint flower got started in there, and it took over, and it filled up the whole worm bed. And so he said, well, we got a mint patch now, and we were making mint tea. And, and so I'm standing there, and I see a, I, by this time I have five hives, and one of them, the bees, bees are 100% black. Which, in retrospect now, you know, the Spanish brought the first bees to New Mexico. Well, first bees to the New World. They brought them to Mexico and they brought them up the Camino Real on carts to all the way up to Santa Fe for their candles. The priests needed them for candles because they needed them in the mass, right? So they were all black. The, the Spanish bee is Iberian, Apis mellifera Iberiensis is a jet black bee. And so, anyway, I had this one hive that was all black bees, and I noticed this bee come and land and start sipping mint from the nectar of the, sipping nectar from the mint. And it was a pure black bee, and I thought, wow, I know where that bee lives. And 
all of a sudden I had this thought, like, I'm going to put the spoon in that honey, even if there's just a little bit. And me and Grandpa, in a few minutes, are going to be eating honey from our bees and our mint and our worms. And all of a sudden I had this brief moment where I felt like the sun and me and the worms and the water was all connected, like we were, the time just stopped. And it was a powerful, powerful, a simple little thing, but it's just a powerful feeling. And I, it, I came to the conclusion, I don't know where my grandpa's going to go, but he's going to be fine. He's, he's, gonna, he's been a good man. He's going to be fine. I have no idea where he's going to wind up. But everything is going to be fine. We're all connected. It's all one big thing. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to be a beekeeper. I'm just got to figure out how to do that. So I went to work for a commercial beekeeper. And I, we had 4,000 hives in New Mexico from about Elephant View Lake up to Albuquerque, and then another batch up around Raton, Cimarron, Maxwell, that neighborhood up in the north of the state. And I learned a lot. I, I, I liked a lot of what I learned. But I also, there's a lot I didn't like. We were using antibiotics pretty liberally. We were using ethylene dibromide to kill wax moths. We, it just seemed like we were kind of rough on the bees. Like I would try to get the bees out of the way before I put a box down, and he'd say, no, we don't got time for that. And I said, well, what if the queen's on there? Don't matter. We don't got, she hardly ever is. Okay. So we just smash them, you know, and, oh, well, that's production agriculture. I understand that. I've worked in a sheep farm and a dairy and all that, but I decided I didn't want to keep doing that. A number of reasons, but um, I, I, went, I quit and went to work for NMDA as a honeybee inspector for about five years. And I'm not very good at paperwork, and it seemed like they got more and more paperwork. The, the more I did, the more I had to, and then they gave me a vehicle and that was even more paperwork. So then I said, oh, I'll, I'll just keep my own bees. So I kept bees for a while, just made my own business. And a lot of times I come back to that vision of when I be on that flower, like when I'm thinking, what about this kind of hive or this kind of treatment or, you know, how does that fit with that picture of that we're all one thing? And what I'm doing to the bee, I'm doing to myself. And and to my kids, so to speak, you know. And I came to that conclusion that, you know, I want to keep bees my own way, and, uh, and it's going to be a more gentle kind of way. It's not going to use of toxic chemistry. I don't believe that toxic chemistry has a place in the beehive. So I started not using antibiotics. In, the, in those days, most people saw, said, well, are you Amish or something? Or what do you got against antibiotics? They're great, you know. They help prevent disease. And I said, well, no, I'm not Amish, but... I mean, I have a lot of respect for the Amish, but um, I just didn't, didn't feel right. Like I, the Greeks didn't need antibiotics. The Egyptians kept these thousands of hives on barges that they could move down the river as the bloom moved, the Nile River. And that was in the pharaoh, times of the pharaoh, you know, and they didn't use antibiotics. So why do we need antibiotics? Well, now we're coming to the conclusion, of course, that we've overused antibiotics in agriculture, and we've exposed ourselves to low levels of broad-spectrum antibiotics, teramycin is oxytetracycline, and that we're breeding disease organisms that are antibiotic resistant, and it's scary. My brother works in the hospital, and he says they're getting further and further behind. There's these MRSA kind of bacteria that they can't kill. Or they practically kill the patient trying to kill the bacteria. So it's, you know, it's a real thing, and the USDA is saying we've got to stop using antibiotics in agriculture, and that's it's going to change agriculture in a big way. So what I've seen over the years, in the 40 years of keeping bees mostly in New Mexico, was that when I joined the association, there was all mostly white men. And it was mostly large scale, like 500 to 4,000 hives. And that slowly began to lose ground because you couldn't make any money selling honey. The barrels of honey were coming in from Argentina and now from China at such a low price that no matter how hard you tried, your diesel fuel bills and everything put you up to where you couldn't make money selling barrels of honey. Because you sold a barrel to somebody who bought loads of barrels from various beekeepers, sold them to a packer like a thousand at a time off a train to Texas, and then the packer bottled up honey from all over the world, mixed yours in with it, and then sold big lots to brokers who sold it to wholesale reps who sold it to jobbers who sold it to the store who finally sold it to the customer. So the beekeeper was like eight levels from the customer. 
and it, there was no money. And um, so now beekeeping has gone, the big scale beekeeping has gone all to pollination. And that means that you try to keep at least 400 hives, that's how much fit on the semi, but hopefully about 10,000 hives. And you keep them alive all year and you just move them from one pollination contract to another. So you go to almonds, everybody goes to the almonds in February, that the, pays the biggest price, about $200 a hive. So if you have a thousand hives, $200,000 sounds real attractive, right? But you've got to move those bees, you've got to back and forth them from, say, Florida to California, and your fuel bills wind up being 50, 60,000. And then from there, you know, you're going to Washington State for apples, maybe cranberries in Maine, melons somewhere. You know, they just have to try to make as many contracts as you can make throughout the year. It's a hard, hard life. You spend your life in a truck with bees. And the worst load, truck, truck stops don't want to see you because they generally leak a little bit of bees and then they think you're chasing away your, their customers. And, you know, it's, and then bees die. If they get hot, they die. You have to spray them. You have to move at night. It's all nighttime work. It's, it's a miserable, hard way to make a living. Recently spoke to the set American honey producers. It's mostly big pollinator beekeepers in San Diego. And I had, that group in the 80s used to be about four or 500 people. And it was down to about 50. Wow. And I said, well, you know, I noticed that there's a lot less people here and everybody has white hair. And one guy from Texas stood up in the back and he said, wah hell, I wouldn't want my kid to do this. It's too much damn work and it don't pay. I thought, ouch. You know that? Because he's pollinating, he says about 15,000 hives. So that's 15,000 acres of almonds, apples, cranberries, alfalfa, alfalfa for seed, that he's pollinating. And when he quits and his son doesn't want to do it, I don't blame his son, well, who's going to do it? You know, we're, we're, we're getting into a bind in pollination. And beyond that, we have all kinds of other creatures that would love to help us pollinate our crops, but we've killed them too. In the Midwest, it's really tough. I'm impressed with your keeping bees in Illinois, because I had a friend who went to Iowa, and that may be, he was right in the middle of corn and soybeans, and he was on a two-acre organic farm. I said, well, two acres isn't going to help a lot. And sure enough, they, they start spraying the corn next to him and killed all his bees. So, so we, as beekeepers, we're very familiar with the negative impact of so-called pesticides, right? I wish they would just kill pests, but they don't. Um, at any rate, so I've seen beekeeping change tremendously. For one thing, women have moved into beekeeping. And it's, they moved in in a really big way. Uh, and this is not just New Mexico. All over the world, Afghanistan, Jamaica, women are moving into beekeeping. The woman behind me in the, with the brown shirt, she's a big force to be reckoned with in Jamaica. She's formed, she's formed the Kingston Area Beekeepers Association. She's also part of the Friendly Society for Healthy Jamaica that is trying to get large portions of the island pesticide free and maybe declare organic for the producers there because the producers can't afford, they're very poor people and they can't afford organic certification. So we're trying to see if we can get the whole area designated organic and make sure that they're not using pesticides. And um, beekeepers are, are important in Jamaica. Maybe I'll get to that later. Um, I became involved with New Mexico Beekeepers Association back in the early 80s. This association existed before World War II. I don't know when it started. It, it, it took a hiatus during World War II because most of the members went to the war. And then after the war, people came back and they restarted it. And it's been in existence ever since. And it's had its ups and downs. I feel like it's on a big up right now. And that's really wonderful to see. Um, Partly, you know, they kept telling me, you need a website, you need a website. You don't exist if you don't have a website. And now Jesse and friends helped, and we got a website, and all of a sudden we exist. <laughs> um, but I, for instance, was president one year when the health department came to us and said, you have to pasteurize honey. You can't put food in a jar and not pasteurize it. We said, well, honey doesn't need pasteurization. You're putting food in a jar, and it has the New Mexico Food Service Sanitation Act says you have to pasteurize it. Well, at which point my former boss cussed him out, you stupid blanky blank bureaucrat, you don't know what the heck, the heck you're talking about, which was true, but didn't help the meeting at all. You know, the, he said, okay, we're pulling product in two weeks. So we pulled together a meeting, we got 
members did research why honey doesn't need to be pasteurized. We found out that honey, raw honey, on a burn, a hospital in New York did a study in 1995. It was the best burn ointment known to modern science at that time. They tried pasteurized honey, raw honey, and then all the sodium sulfathiazine and all their drugs. And raw honey was the best. So that now today, if you get a really bad big section of, a, of your body burned, they will get a band-aid with honey in it and put it on you. And it's the best burn ointment we know of. So when you raise bees, you're not just making yourself some food and pollinating, you're making some mess. You know, you're making, as a matter of fact, in Jamaica, most people can't afford to buy honey to eat. They buy it as a medicine for their help. When the kids get sick, they take a teaspoon, or you can put it on a wound or whatever. Um, certain kinds of bug bites and things. So, what we did is we met again with the Department of uh, Health Department, and I told my boss not to go to the meeting. I, I didn't want him at the meeting, he didn't go. And then we, he said, well, you know, maybe you need to be exempt, but that's your problem. And so how do we be exempt? And he said, well, that's, you have to change the law. And he just got up and left. And I was like, how, how are we going to change the law? I have no idea. So his food scientist came up and showed me that there was, it said, fruits and vegetables are exempt. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I'm not supposed to do this. Just, I don't know why he wasn't supposed to to this day, but finally realized, oh, we have to say, Fruits, vegetables, and honey are exempt. And but then we wound up having to define honey as pure honey. Anyway, I went to the New Mexico State Legislature, and I walked around asking, and GX McSherry was a senator or a congressman back in those days who was wearing cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll look at this, and he called me later, and he said, yeah, well, I'm going to sponsor that bill. Thank you, sir, we'll be right there, and I drove to Santa Fe, and we got it worded through the New Mexico Legal Council or something like that, made a definition of pure honey and all that. And to make a long story short, it passed. We got it passed in one legislative, one try. And what impressed me was that GX took us down to the lunch room to have lunch. And he said, you know, some boy, sometimes this place makes me sick. And then I said, well, then why'd you bring us here? He said, no, I don't mean the food. I said, look over there, and there was a young man sitting at a table. He was a legislator. And there was a young woman with a very low-cut blouse hanging over him. And he was just red in the face, sweating a little bit. He was obviously completely transfixed. And he said, she's a lobbyist for the electric company. He's voting on her bill. How do you think he's going to vote on her bill? And he said, there are four lobbyists for every legislator in this building when we're in session. I said, wow. And this is just New Mexico. You know, this isn't national. Can you imagine national politics? Millions of dollars in play. But anyway, it, we, what I found was that when citizens went to the legislature to ask for a bill to be passed or not be passed, the legislature like, oh, these, there's actual real people here. Because they know all the lobbyists. They see them every day. But when they see actual citizens come in, they're like, Oh, we better be careful here. There's people watching, and they they pass their bill, you know, and so that's where uh, our group comes in handy. Groups come in handy too because we we teach each other. S some of you just start keeping beekeeping. Your brain works completely different from mine, and you're going to notice something that in all my 40 years of keeping bees, I never noticed. And if we get together and we communicate what we've found, either on the internet or sometimes in actual face-to-face -face meetings. Then we all learn. And the only way we're going to rise is if we all rise together. You know, The almond growers are finding out, for instance, they thought, well, we're going to spray this fungicide. Yeah, it's not good for the bees. But we're paying them a lot of money, so heck with them. And they can buy more bees, right? They thought they could leave the beekeeper behind. And the beekeeper has wound up being kind of like a little tiny industry that, had, in terms of dollars that we produce, a very small amount of money. But we have our finger firmly in the ring of a big old bull, and we've said, kneel, and that bull is going, okay. And they're kneeling because they know they can't raise almonds without our bees. And they have to stop killing bees, period. And they know it. Paramount Almonds has 80,000 acres of almonds. They've now gone to, they've hired a pollination biologist, and he's getting them to 
changed everything. They've always wanted bare dirt under the almond trees because they said, we don't want no flowers competing with the almonds when we're paying $200 a hive to get the almonds pollinated by bees. What he found out was that bees get sick of almond pollen. Just like, I love chocolate, but I can only eat so much and then I can't eat another bite of chocolate, right? And if you plant clover under those trees, two things happen. The bees pollinate the almonds and then they go down and eat the clover and then they're back on the almonds again. They actually pollinate the almonds better when there's clover under the almonds than when there isn't. And he proved that, okay? The other thing he found out was that, very interesting, clover is, by the way, fixing nitrogen. So it's reducing your fertilizer needs. And there's a thing called a peach tree maggot. It's a little fly. Flies up into the almonds and peaches and it lays eggs. And they hatch and they destroy the peach or the almond. And then they get fat and they drop to the soil and they pupate in the soil and they come out as flies and they go up and lay more eggs. And so you get these cycles and eventually you get tons of them. Well, when there's clover covering the soil, they, a lot of them, they land on the leaves and stuff and they don't do very well. Those that get down to the dirt, if it's shaded, they get moldy. And those that finally get into the dirt and are able to pupate, the flowers can get to be that high. They, they grow clover and sometimes something called fillhead and, and phacelia. And when the little fly comes up through it, there's thousands of little wasps sipping nectar out of those flowers that are predators of flies. And it stops the flies from flying up into the trees. It's actually better at controlling peach tree maggot than the spray for controlling peach tree maggot. So what I'm thinking is we need to start trying to build biological systems. We're not going to go back to the Stone Age or the hunter-gatherer age. This is not about going back to anything. It's going forward into the biological age. Learning to use the biology that exists and tweak it and enhance it so that we can continue to thrive as a species. But for instance, the almond pollinators, almond growers wanted to leave the beekeepers behind. Well, when we're dragging them down with us. When they killed 80,000 of our hives last year, they suffer. We all suffer. So the only way we're going to rise is if we all rise together. And by all rise, I mean not just us, not all just people. We've got to get the bees to rise with us. We realize that we need bees. We need earthworms. We probably need a lot of other insects that we're not even aware of, those little wasps. But we haven't been aware of our need. And now the bees have said, look, you kill us. You don't have anything to eat. I mean, bees pollinate alfalfa seeds. So I would say they're responsible for a certain amount of our meat and dairy, as well as fruits and vegetables, right? We need bees. We need all the pollinators. And so the almond growers are now saying, we're going to figure out how to grow almonds and not kill bees. We're going to keep bees right in the orchard year round. And when we kill the bees, we made a mistake. And to me, that's, that's good news. That's making progress, where we can rise up. Um, when we get to Mars, if we get to Mars, there's going to be food on those spaceships that was grown by crops on the earth in dirt with earthworms in the roots and bees in the flowers. And that's the only way. We have never eaten anything that didn't come from a natural biological system. That's all there is to eat. In the, as far as we know, in the whole universe. Now, there may be other planets where we can live, but that's a big maybe. This is the only place we got, and we've got to take care of it. And bees are helping us figure that out. Um, I, so I've been keeping bees. I kept bees up near Bernalillo. I moved down to south of Berlin. Kept bees as far south as Tier C. Then moved up to Taos. But I've been kind of chased by the drought. And also, <clears throat> um, a couple of factors happened that caused me to move to California. The drought has been pretty intense. And the desert used to make a lot of honey, and it isn't making honey. The urban areas actually are doing a little better um, in terms of honey production because people's flowers and stuff. Also, <clears throat> I've been teaching beekeeping here for 35 years. And so I have students that are doing a wonderful job teaching. And <clears throat> um, I feel like there's a limited market for teaching beekeeping. In California, it's just there's millions of people. I mean, the Bay Area alone is just full of people that want to learn to keep bees. And they have a lot of money. There's Silicon Valley is really coming into beekeeping in a big way. 
of small scale hobby backyard beekeeping. And these are executives with, you know, multi million dollar houses, and they want to take beekeeping classes. And I'm happy to help them with that. Um, also, if we can tweak the agriculture in the almonds, that sends a ripple throughout the whole United States, throughout the whole world. Look, how are we going to change agriculture? We have to change agriculture in general. We've got to get away from toxicity and figure out a calm, sensible, scientific, biological way to produce food without poisoning the bees, frogs, people. You know, Dr. Joe Foreman recently was a pediatrician at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and he did a study, a long study, on what is causing, is there more autism in the United States, or are we just measuring it better? And what he determined is, no, autism is rising exponentially, and it is changing. It's not, it, it's not just that we're measuring it better. There is more autism. And then he went into why, and he came to the conclusion that it's actually fairly easy, because certain groups of people are having a lot more autism in their kids than others. Applicators that put pesticides on crops have a much higher rate of autistic children. Um, farm laborers. Migrant farm laborers have much higher rates of autism. So it's pretty clear that it's pesticides in agriculture that are causing the autism. It's not necessarily that the pesticide is on the fruit they're eating. It's the parent's exposure to the pesticide is causing a, what do you, they call an epigenetic change in either the sperm or the egg that is causing autism in the child. So this is not just about protecting the bees. It's about protecting ourselves. There is no over there. It's all us. And when we poison that thing over there, a lot of times they like to tell us it breaks down. That means it disappears. It doesn't disappear. DDT broke down into DDE and it's still there. And it's still toxic. So we've got to learn how to deal with less and less toxins. Um, and beekeepers uh, included, you know, we started using Apistan to get, get rid of the raw mite. I remember being at a conference in uh, Colorado Springs. National Conference, and I was already predisposed, I've always been predisposed to how can we do without a toxin? Antibiotics, mycocytes, all that. And I've been reading about a beekeeper in Italy who was who has monitoring feral colonies and realizing that when the Veromite came, they all, dis all but disappeared, they died. And he was bemoaning because he thought, boy, the Italian bee is the best bee in the world, everybody wants our Italian bees, and now they've died for the most part. And then he noticed that a few came back and in, in three years. And in, by eight years, they were right back to where they were before. And they were still bright orange. And they were nobody was treating them, and they were surviving. So he was like, yes, see, our Italian bee has come through. It's the best bee in the world. And, and now they're totally mite resistant. And I read that article, and I thought, well, that's cool. Let's, maybe we could go get some of his bees, some of those feral Italian bees, and bring them over or something. Went to this meeting. and. People had been devastated by the Varroa mite. It was killing thousands of hives, and they were couldn't keep their bees alive. And then they approved Apistan, and it was keeping their bees alive. And they were like, everybody was praising Apistan. Oh, it's so wonderful. Wow, we're back in business, you know. And Dr. Tom Rinder was saying, yeah, but I've been studying Apistan. It's really bad for the bees. Oh, yep, yeah, Apistan is great. You know, it's wonderful. It's, it's keeping us alive. It's reducing queen fertility. It's reducing worker longevity. Worker longevity is a big thing because the queen will eventually get to where she's laying as much as she can lay. Boom, 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 boom. She can weigh her weight and a half in eggs a day. So if you weigh 100 pounds, you can lay 150 pounds worth of eggs a day. That's bordering. I mean, it makes me, I would die. You know? <laughs> at 50 pounds, I would die. I can't imagine. So when she's laying at her maximum output, then the, what the limit on the population becomes worker longevity. If they, the longer they live, the higher the population is going to get because pretty soon they're going to be dying as fast as she's laying eggs and then the population is going to taper off. It's going to stay steady, right? So worker longevity is really important to the robustness of the, of the hive. So he kept saying these things and nobody wanted to hear it. They were literally turned a deaf ear to it. And then another man was there from AI Root. He's buying beeswax from all the beekeepers to make in the foundation to sell back to you to put your hives to, for the bees to draw the wax into the frames. 
And he said, you know, I've been testing it lately because they made the Apistan oil soluble, so it wouldn't get in the honey. It's getting in the wax. And I'm getting wax from you guys that has enough fluvalinate in it, the active ingredient, that it would kill your bees. It's above the LD50 for bees. So I can't use it. I mean, I don't think you want me to use it because it would kill your bees. And one of the beekeepers pretty close to me said, well, you should not be testing it because people think of beeswax as something pure. And if they hear about that, they're going to think it isn't pure. I thought, because it isn't pure, it would kill your bees. You know, of course you should be testing it. But that's, it showed me how much people want to believe what they want to believe, and they don't want to hear what they don't want to believe. So Dr. Rinder eventually was the one that went to Russia, where the mite came from, found mite-resistant bees, verified that they were indeed mite-resistant, and then got permission through Animal Health Inspection Service to bring them to an island off of Baton Rouge in the Gulf and quarantine them for one of in three years, and then to the United States, to Baton Rouge, and then disseminated them. And they have a trait where they go out and, the, like when a mite crawls on a bee, our, initially our bees didn't seem to notice. They just let them crawl all over them. And, but the Russian bees, the, the bee would buzz, and her sister would sense or feel the buzz, come over to her, find the mite, and crush it. And if you look at the bottom of the hive, there's all these mangled mites at the bottom of the hive. So that's a trait that they pass on to their daughters that helps them get rid of the mite. There's another trait that's come up since that was sort of discovered or, or enhanced in Minnesota by Ronald Spivak. The mite is a pregnant female, and it winds up crawling off the bee and down into the larvae cell right before the larvae spins its cocoon. So it winds up inside the cocoon with the larvae. It bites the larvae, sucks blood, often transmits a virus that can deform the wings of the bee. And then it starts laying eggs. It lays a male and then a series of females. The male mates with the females and then dies. The females suck blood from the bee. And then when the bee hatches out of the cell, they could, now four or five come out with it. And so this particular, there's a variety of bees called varroa sensitive hygiene. When the mite bites the larvae, the larvae gives off an alarm smell. Bees mostly communicate by smell, not by sound. So, so the nurse bees walking around on top of the cocoons smell it through the cocoon top. Uncap, cut the cocoon open. Haul the larvae and the mite out and throw it away. And it stops the mite from reproducing. It's kind of hard on their own larvae, but it stops the mite from reproducing. So there are a number of traits now that we know that bees can reduce, can reduce the mite population. And we figure that all beehives in the United States have mites, and we need to be breeding bees for mite resistance. Every time we help the bees kill, their, kill the mites for the bees, we wind up encouraging this mite susceptibility. And we need, we need to be working with nature's resistance. When we use apistan, it only took about three years for the mites to become resistant to the apistan. Then we went to kumafos. And it took about three years, and then we had mice that were resistant to apistan and kumafos. Then we went to emetrans. And you know, that's, that's just one toxic solution after another. And when we use mite-resistant bees, now we're using nature's resistance instead of fighting it. And that's where we need to be. In the long term, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh, we're in a hurt. This year, we're not going to get the crops pollinated if we don't save these bees. Let's use a chemical. We might have to, might have to resort to that. That's kind of like the, the Native Americans have war chiefs and peace chiefs. And so during peace times, the peace chief is trying to make alliances with everybody and pulling everything together and smoothing things out and giving people gifts and you know making the society work. The war chief is like, oh, right now we're going to stop everything and you get this resources and go over there and kill those people and do what we have to do right now. You know, no long-term thinking. So in terms of beekeeping, we can have the war chief while we have something that's going to kill beekeeping in the United States. We've got to stop it right now. And then in the meantime, the rest of us start figuring, well, how are we going to get around this in the long term? Because we know the chemical solution isn't going to keep working. And let's find a better way. And we can even look ahead. There is a mite that we don't have in America yet. It's 
called Triple Inaps. The Romate was in Asia, and then all of a sudden, it was there for thousands of years. And all of a sudden, it started to spread up into Europe, first Eastern and then Western Europe, down into Africa, then over into South America, and then into the United States. Well, right now, this Triple Inaps is starting to spread into Eastern Europe and throughout Africa. So we're already, we could say, we should consider ourselves warned that the triple ellipse is on its way. What about going now to Asia and looking for Apis mellifera resistant to triple ellipse and bringing semen over? We don't have to import the bees because then we can bypass the quarantine. Just bring frozen semen over and, and for, artificially and fertilize, fertilize some queens and get a genetic backfire for the triple ellipse before it even gets here. What about thinking ahead? That's what we need. You know, we need to show that we are intelligent and we are also wise. And I look at there's a big difference between intelligence and wisdom. Where intelligence means we can figure out to do almost anything we put our mind to. Wisdom is what do we do for the long term? What about how this decision affects my grandkids and my great-grandkids? And that's where we, we need to be better at. We've been good at making short-term profits and things. We need to think long term. And bees teach us that because bees are a superorganism. They take care of each other. They cooperate. We also cooperate really well. We are, and we're at our strength when we cooperate. Big companies are big cooperative entities. They just need to make sure we need to make sure that their goal is not just profit in the bank, but instead the well-being of the people whom they're working for and with, right? Um, I'm going to jump to these pictures just because, and then I'll try to get to some more how-to stuff with beekeeping. Um, I started volunteering in Jamaica. Jamaica has a lot of really poor people. Um, that a lot of people make about six dollars a day when they can find work. It's hard to find even that. Um, so I, I published that book um, that's there. Um, well, Chelsea Green published the company, but. Um, they read about the book in Jamaica and they said, those kind of hives can work here because they banned American beeswax because they heard that American beeswax is so toxic that they didn't want to import wax. And the type of hive that I use, it's called a topper hive. You don't put in foundation. It doesn't require beeswax. They make their own. You actually make more wax. Wax becomes a product that you can sell with those hives. So I started going to Jamaica as a volunteer. They paid USAID and some groups paid me, paid my airfare and my room and board so that I didn't, to, I didn't lose any money, but I didn't make any money. And I, I, and I loved it. I've, I've, I've lived in Ecuador. I've been a sheep herder with no running water, you know, just a bucket. And I like living like that. I, I really do. So, um, This is a young woman who got into bees in a similar way that I did, getting kind of off into a difficult path and then finding the bees really helped her out, helped make sense, and she um, is New Mexican. She was born and raised in Albuquerque, but she's now, I think she's in Texas. She's been working for queen breeders in California, and I got her involved in the project in Jamaica, and she and I made that hive out of wicker. So that's a, a top RB hive, but it's made out of wicker, for, in, for, which is a vine that grows in Jamaica. Um, this was a group that so Jamaica has free health care. You go to a clinic, any clinic, and it's completely free. It really doesn't matter who you are. You just walk in and they'll take care of things. So if you have a broken arm, they said it. Right? And, uh, but there was a young man that had a brain tumor, and they really needed to send him to the United States, and they just don't have any money. So the woman um, with the orange headdress in front, all the way on that side, I'm really bad at left and right. She is a talk show radio host, radio talk show host, and she's a Rastafarian. Rastafarianism is a religion that really started in Jamaica. And I often thought, oh, they just smoke a lot of marijuana or something. And they, they do some of that, there's no doubt. But, but they have a whole ethic, and it's based on the Old Testament, the Bible, and it's very, they're very organic. And it came really out of a response to slavery, because Jamaica is, of course, <clears throat> a bunch of escaped slaves, so to speak. It, it was a slave colony, and the slaves escaped, and the Maroons took over the island for a while. They called them the Maroons. And then it became a British colony, and they became more or less enslaved again. 
and now they've been independent, but um, anyway, so, the, so what we were doing, this woman was organizing a walkathon to raise money for this boy to get his tumor work done here in the United States. Uh, this is a picture <coughs> of a hive that somebody from Oman, the nation of Oman, an Arabic nation, sent me. I thought, well, that's cool, because it's, he's using basket hoops that you can see over there that are stapled together, and he's spacing them, and they're just building comb right in the hoop. And I, I wrote to him, and I said, that's an amazing hive, I would like to build one. And he wrote back to me that I prefer the soapen tape of Oman. He's wearing a general's hat and a bunch of medals on his chest. And then the rest of it was quotes from the Quran. So they were okay. But we have a little bit in common. Uh, yes, we're not a lot. But. This is a group. Um, we, so the big tall guy in the back, his name is Quao, and he has a farm in Jamaica. He's, his mother was American, but he, was, he's, he lives in Jamaica. And his dad was Jamaican. And he is the one that initiated me and a bunch of New Mexicans coming to teach, help teach or train beekeepers. What we found is there was a lot of very good beekeepers already in Jamaica. But we, we could exchange and learn from each other. And then we'd go out into the very rural areas and meet beekeepers like these. And some of them were, had very little knowledge about beekeeping. And we could help them. And it was a great time. The woman standing off near me, the tall American woman with the bright forehead there, she's a deaf person and she is taking beekeeping to deaf people now. And um, having a great time with it. She's a very enthusiastic person. Um, Quao here lighting a smoker in front, me in the back with a blue shirt and the veils. These guys saw that Quao was keeping bees behind his house and they decided they found a few bee boxes. They got some bees started. There's no frames in the boxes. So it just combs every which way. And they said, how do we get the honey out? And I said, I don't know. Let's try it. Let's see what we can do. So we just reached in there and broke off little bits here and there. They were, ah, oh, this is wonderful, you know. Well, it seems a little crude to me, but if it works for you, it's fine. Um, this, I'll just buzz through some of these. This was a queen raising class in near Kingston. In <coughs> Um, this is a class in Sedona, Arizona, and Sedona has Africanized bees, and so they, they're working, this is a top bar comb, so this is a comb without a freight, as you can see, and that's the kind of hype that I've gone to these days. I try to insist that people wear veils in my class. This young woman kept refusing, and I have to admit there was a time or two when I thought, I, I wish she'd get stung. <laughs> then I realized, no, I don't want her to get stung. You know, I, I just felt like, knowing that the bees were kind of cranky, I really didn't, but anyway, she went away with the fine, but I, I look at the veil as, I had a friend who was keeping bees for many years, and he even had his belt buckle said, El Abajero, which is a way of saying the beekeeper in Spanish, Abajero is bee, so Abajero would be the bee man. And one day he came to me to buy some bees, and he put on a full suit and gloves and zipped himself in, and said, wow, you, you never wore that much protection before. He said, well, I'm almost quit keeping bees. Really? Yeah, well, I, I was going to a conference, he's a pediatrician, he said, I was going to a conference in Atlanta, and I was trying to get my cows fed and irrigation done so that my wife wouldn't have a bunch of work to do while I was gone. And I wanted to check one behind to see if it needed a super, but I put it off, and finally, at the end of the day, with a storm rolling in, I decided, I'm going to take a quick look, they're very docile, and he popped the lid open, and he got instantly about 30 stings right around his eyes and nose and ears. He fell down. They started stinging him all over his chest, under his arms, and he went out. His wife drug him away. She got stung. So got him to the hospital. He was in shock. They pulled the stingers out. And he finally he recovered. But it was hard on his kidneys, apparently. Enough bee venom can damage your kidneys. And it's permanent. can be permanent. So, he decided, you know what? He knew he broke every rule, you know. And normally you could even, I've worked bees without a veil. And if they're in a good mood, it's not a big deal. But it's, if they hit, get you right in the eye, it really hurts. If they get your actual eyeball, you might lose your eye. So it's, a veil, I figure, is minimal respect, okay? You need to lose your fear of beekeeping, but, of bees, but not your respect. 
That's the way I like to put it. Coffee plant up in Venezuela I was invited to come and help them evaluate bees pollinate coffee. They make a slightly caffeinated honey from coffee. Um, these people thought if they could get a bunch of organic coffee beans going and organic honey, they could try to import it directly to the United States instead of going through brokers and make some money. And so they were, I was up around the mountains of Venezuela looking at that and had a great time. You know, Venezuela is not nearly as chaotic as the news would have you believe. There is trouble there. There's certainly chavistas and anti-chavistas, but for instance, healthcare is free, education through college is free, um, gasoline, you pull up to the gas station in a big old American car, they fill it up for three cents. And you drive, you tip the man five cents just for filling it. It's basically gasoline is free. And the problem, of course, is that Colombians and Brazilians are coming in and smuggling gas out. And, and, and certainly he nationalized the oil companies to do that. Um, that's how they were drying their coffee. You know, these are very poor people. The thing I like about top bar hives is that you can make a top bar hive with your hands out of no money, no tools, practically, if you can make bigger. And so these kinds of people, they're doing things on the small scale that the poor people in the world can access beekeeping through top bar hives much more easily than through the Langstrom system. I had a meeting with the Rural Agric Agricultural Development Association. This is part of the bid to ban pesticides in certain areas of Jamaica. I trained, we would do beeswax training. So this, we would go out to the sea, and the sea urchins leave these round, skeleton-like things on the beaches. Beautiful little things. I don't, they call them sea stars in uh, Jamaica. And you can paint them with vegetable oil, and then with the caulking, so that's what the caulk gun is there for, I would paint the sea star with the caulking in six layers, let each layer dry before I painted the next. And then you could cut it open, break out the sea star, clean it a little bit, put a wick in it, fill it with wax, and now you had a candle exactly the shape of the sea star. And so I was, we were trying to figure out, like, if you get a lot of wax, could you sell something to the tourist markets or to each other and make a little more money? Probably, you know, these, I put these pictures, someday I'm going to make an actual slideshow that is more coherent. But, so this is just some of the people who make probably their candles that they made. We were using Dixie cups or whatever we could come up with to make a candle. More of the same. Um, you know, that's a worry hive. I'm just going to quickly brush over that. I personally don't think worry has a future. Worry winds up being a fixed comb hive. You can't inspect the combs. You can't find the queen if you decide Oh, this queen isn't laying very good, or this queen is too mean, the bees are too mean. You can't find her to be queen the hive, so I don't think those kind of hives have a future. There's a flower in Jamaica. That's a bee yard in Jamaica, so those are their top bar hives kind of sprinkled back through the forest. They tend to keep them in more open areas because they have lots of small hive beetle, and the sun reduces, good sunshine on the hives reduces the small hive beetle. Um, you're going to get small high beetle probably around here, but possibly. I don't know. We certainly have them all through California and all through Texas and Florida. And uh, it's hard to say. They'll, they might not like the dry soil, but this year it's been kind of wet, so who knows. Um, this was a meeting of the Friendly Society for Healthy Jamaica talking about banning. So, I, I just want to point out the woman all the way on that side, Leticia. She's the president of the Kingston Area Beekeepers Association. A powerful little dynamo, you know, beautiful little vibrant woman. And she, I mean, I've seen her, she told everybody to turn their cell phones off at the meeting. And somebody's cell phone went off and he answered it. And she kind of leaps over people, grabs him by his ear, <laughs> pulls him out the door. And he said, we turn it off, we turn it off. And yeah, turn it off if you want, but you're out. You're out. And so she locks the door and then all the other cell phones went, ding dong. <laughs> so she's a force to be reckoned with. This is a bee yard in Covalo, California. So where I'm in Covalo, it's a very rural area. There are bear, deer, elk. It's up in the mountains. I really like it there. Bees are doing really well. There's a big pear orchard there. The thing about Covalo too is that they hardly ever get a frost. 
they get fruit every year, which is kind of nice. Um, and this is one of my beehives. So you can see my hives are pretty crude. I don't paint them much. They are very inexpensive. Most of them I found scrap lumber. I didn't pay any money for the hive. I just put in the labor of cutting them up and putting them together. I put them on stands. They're actually, in my case, two beehives in each of those boxes. I'm raising bees primarily for raising bees, not so much for honey production. I may have, I will have to get into some honey production. Um, I am actually now engaged to a Jamaican woman, and from here I leave to Jamaica, hopefully to pick her up and bring her back on a fiancé visa. This is her house. <clears throat> Jamaicans, there's nothing to mirror about Jamaicans. They're very um, comfortable in the way they dress and the way they... I, she's in the... I, I, if I can go back if you want to see a picture of her, but... Um, this is just her house. And oh, I mentioned this is her water system. So there's, there's barrels beside the house, and there is a pipe, a little white piece of pipe sticking out at that bottom corner by that center block-like thing. That occasionally has water in it, and when it does, you get out there and fill every barrel as soon as it's full, you transfer it. If it's two in the morning, you get out there and you do it. And so you have actually a way of making it drip so that it'll wake you up and hear it. You'll hear it, and then you get out because you might not have water for another week. And water is a very, even though there's a lot of water in Jamaica, it's, the distribution is a mess. This is me moving my bees from New Mexico to Covalo. I'm stuck in a, a parking lot in Santa Rosa, California, and those are my beehives, the stands, and the, I use a bathtub for my solar wax melter, and that's all sitting there. It's kind of like um, the rapes of the bees of wrath or something. <laughs> This is doing a bee removal out of this forest service building up in Covalo, California. I just go into the wall, I cut the brood out, lay it gently in, as gently as I can, in the back of the top bar hive. If I find the queen, I'll usually cage her, put her in a little queen cage, tuck her underneath there somewhere where the sun won't hurt her, and then I continue taking all the comb out. Any honey, I put in a honey bucket and just harvest it because they went up drowning in it and getting all good up in it, so it doesn't really help them that much. And then I'll put a comb from another top bar hive right in front of that, and then just empty top bars, and then they just build the combs on the empty top bars. There are no frames in a top bar hive. That's the wall that I was taking the bees out of, and when I'm about done, I'll leave it there till nightfall. You can see the holes right in front of my arms there where the bees were coming and going. Now there's no place for them to stay in the wall, so they'll come into the hive, which I will prop up near there. And then at night, when they're all in, I'll come back and pick it up and take it home. And the Forest Service pays me $200 to get the bees out. The bees don't get exterminated, so they're happy. I get bees and $200, so I'm happy. Everybody's happy. Bee removal service can make money here in Las Cruces. There's no doubt if somebody, and you wind up getting some tools, like a bee vac, a vacuum that you can adjust, and you can vacuum them out. But if you, and it's, I think it's a young man's job, more than somebody who's willing to do some construction and stuff, climb up on ladders and things like that. But there are people in Los Angeles, San Diego, Phoenix, making lots of money doing bee removals. And then they come up with all the bees, and they wind up selling the beekeepers. And, um, it's a good thing to do. I got a question for you about that. Do you go about re-cleaning those uh, wild hives you might uh, remove? If there's a problem. If there's not a problem, I feel like the wild hives can be some of the best hives. They're, they're mite resistant, nobody's been treating them, they're, and a lot of them are very workable. A story to tell there, so there's a woman in Los Angeles that has started doing bee removals. She was not a really, uh, she just read that bees were in trouble and decided, I'm going to go save some bees. And she educated herself as best she could and went out and got some bees out of water meters. The bee club told her, you're crazy, those are Africanized, you should just take a can of rain. She said, I'm not killing my bees, I just saved them. And so they thought she was being naive, but you know, her bees were very workable. Then she was told, well, I got this beehive in my backyard in a chest of drawers, and I'll, I'll pay you to get them out. So she went there, and she makes a lot of, she has a lot of money. She's not doing this for the money. She has about 40 hives now, in the, right in downtown LA. And she went to that um, backyard, saw the chest of drawers, she said she was about 50 feet from it. 
She's put on her veil, started lighting her smoker, and pretty soon she had about 100 bees trying to sting her through the veil. They were all over her bee suit. She hadn't even gotten near the beehive. So she backed off in a cloud of smoke, told the, smoke, the homeowner, you know what, you have to call an exterminator. So what we need to do with the feral bees is pick and choose. And when they get too cranky, the best thing to do, it's hard to requeen a cranky hive. Because you've got to find the queen and they're like, trying to probably get into you at times. So the best thing to do is in the morning, go over there, bring another empty hive, pick up that hive and move it up as far 30, 40 feet away if you can, tip it at a different angle, and put an empty hive in its the old site. Take a comb even from any hive and put it in there so that the field bees will come back to that hive and they'll try to repopulate it. And that means you just lost a third of your bees. And you lost the older third, which is the meaner third of the bees. Humans, of course, get nicer as we age, but bees get old, crankier as they get older. So, and then if that still ends up being a, literally a pain to work through, then just break that up into put two or three empty hives there and lift a bunch of cones out and put some in each and then walk away from it and come back in a few days, and by then they'll have come way down, and there's only one box that has a queen in it. The others are raising queens, and you know they're not there. She's not there. You find the queen, and I would just crush her, get a new queen in there, buy one or something. You could put it all back together, or you could have separate hives and give them each queens. But you can't keep mean bees. It's no fun for you or your neighbors. It could get you in trouble. But, but there's a lot of... The, the Brazilians and the Texans, I was just recently in Austin, Texas, and they have Africanized bees. And they say, you know, most of them are very workable. There's a few that we have to get rid of. So we're going to have to work with them. They're also very mite resistant, disease resistant. They're very productive. They have for good traits. And we just have to weed out the bad ones. Palo Alto. This is an olive tree in an executive's backyard in Palo Alto. And he said they never pollinated his own olives. I got up at, I, I used to herd sheep, so I, I get up like at four in the morning. I, my body just says, oh, the sun's coming up. Better see what's happening. And so I got out there, and there were bees all over his olive tree. And I took a picture, and then he said, I never see bees on it. They say, you have to get up early. <laughs> so trees make pollen at certain times of the day, and that way they get the bees all working the, their pollen, and that increases their chance of getting the right pollen on them. So it's a kind of a strategy that the plants have worked out with the bees for their own pollination. Nature is pretty amazing, and we need to learn to work with it instead of against it. Um, Palo Alto is cool because these people have a lot of money. They're literally swimming in money, and they want to help beekeepers. So uh, back in Jamaica, so I wind up kind of teaching in Palo Alto and then going to Jamaica and Getting away too much money, but um, this is right outside of my fiance's house, and you cannot possibly eat all the mangoes. They just and mangoes are pollinated by bees. They make honey. They're, um, they're delicious, but you just cannot possibly eat them. This winds up being a chore. After everybody eats as much as they can, the kids go out and have to pick them up and take them to a compost pit just because they're going to rot right there in front of the house and start smelling kind of sickly sweet and mm, not too good. So, and this is their water system, the pipe that almost never has water in it. Um, but beautiful people, really um, hard working, very innovative. I think this next picture, so the young man in the pink there, they wear very bright colors there. He is one of the cousins and he has become a barber and a tailor. And so I bought a pair of pants in Jamaica that were too long. He cut them and hemmed them for me, free. You know, nobody, they take care of each other. Let's put it that way. They, so he's, he's the, the barber for the whole community. The young man in the green shirt is going to wind up coming here with me. He's, he'll be my stepson. And, um, it, but everybody takes care of everybody. It's a very, um, like a colony of bees, you know, everybody has a job and everybody, nobody asks, everybody wants to contribute. Uh, back in Kovlo, 
I have set up this bee yard with a bear fence. There are plenty of bear there, brown bear, big bears. And so, um, so far, it's been okay. I had one bear trouble here in New Mexico. I've always set up bear fences and never had any trouble. Last year in Peñasco, New Mexico, up near Taos, um, a bear decided that he didn't care about the electric shock, just went through and started eating beehives. And I finally, um, Game and Fish never gave me a permit, but I heard him tell a lady, uh, I heard him talking to a lady, the bear was going in her house and ripping open her freezer and eating stuff out of her freezer. And she, she was a little Hispanic lady, she said, I'm going to shoot a gun and scare him out. And he, the man said, don't scare him. If you're going to shoot, kill him. Or hire somebody, or get your friends or family to come in and kill him, but don't scare him. So that to me was, okay. So I staked him out and I shot him and I butchered him and we ate him and I kicked, kept his claws and everything. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, bears can be in trouble. If you're anywhere near bears, you have to protect your bees. And so let me just say that New Mexico Game and Fish used to um, we issued kill permits if a bear would kill your bees. But then I had bees at Mount um, Bosque del Apache Refuge by near Socorro there. I put up a bear fence. And then Game and Fish, after a few years, came to me and they said, How are your bees in Bosquecito? And I said, Oh, fine. I said, well, Were you aware that the bee yards on both sides of your bee yard have been completely destroyed by bears six times now? I said, I don't talk to Jerry very much, but I'm really sorry to hear that. Well, we're going to call a meeting because we've killed a lot of bears over those bees, and we don't want to do it anymore. I said, okay, I already knew that means we're going to have a contentious meeting. But well, I went to the meeting, and basically they were saying, you know, look, you have to keep giving us kill permits because we can't afford to protect our bees with bear fences. And I said, wait a minute, that bear fence cost me that time, two hundred dollars. Now it costs about three hundred dollars. Um, one of those hives is worth three hundred dollars. Easy. You guys have lost six thousand, eight thousand dollars worth of bees and all the honey production for several years in a row now because you don't want to spend three hundred dollars. And you know, granted, and then you pay four hundred dollars to have somebody kill the bear, and now the bear is dead. And game of this is Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge. This is, you know, supposed to be a safe place for wildlife. So, I'm, you know, I don't mean to be like the environmentalist, you know, but I'm, it just makes sense. That I, I don't. I also don't want to kill all the bears in in the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge just because I decided to keep bees. So, this makes sense. It works. The main thing is you want to wire close to the bottom. I haven't tightened this up yet. I'll tighten it up. But the ribbon is really easy to put up. You put in T posts insulators, just string that ribbon, I go from the gate and back and to the gate and back and, uh, and that way I make my own little loop that's a gate, it doesn't cost me anything. And then you want the bottom wire to be about six inches at the most above ground so that when the bear, they tend to come with their nose to the ground and you want them to get, you don't want them to get his head under and then get shot and have it ripped up. You want to get him right on the nose and get him out of there. One time I had a bear go through one and it wasn't, it only had about four wires. And it was in an orchard in, in uh, Truchas, New Mexico, up in the mountains. And the orchardist called me and said that the bear got through and destroyed a hive. And I said, well, I'm just going to move the bees out. And he said, no, I really want you to keep the bees here. But I'm going to put more wire on it for you. I'm going to charge it to my charger from my plug-in charger. And I'm going to put bacon on it. And he did that. And the bear never showed up again. Apparently the bear licks it off and gets a good zap right on the tongue. But the thing is that could be saving the bear's life because otherwise we could have issue a kill permit. This is where the farm where I'm staying in Covalo now. It used to be a big fruit farm. There's plums, peaches, apples, all kinds of fruit and lots of asparagus, um, berries galore. Well, the blackberries just be, are terrible weeds. You can't they get to be 10 feet tall, and they just take over the whole countryside. And so you have to chop them out. But there's raspberries, strawberries. So you know, California is not too bad. Uh, there's some good things about it. I've learned that the winters are very cold and dank, 
And so beehives get mildew inside. So I'm going to learn to keep them in sunnier locations, keep them drier, make better tops that shed the water better. So, you know, it's different. I'm going to learn. There's different flowers. But, you know, I start making honey in March. And I was actually had honey for sale in April, a little bit. And then I made divides. I traveled back and forth to Jamaica too much. But um, now I just was making blackberry honey when I left. And the star thistle was about to bloom. So, you know, there's good honey there. This is a very isolated area. There's no there's a reservation here. Um, and it's, there's no big farming. The only, there's one big organic farm that uses horses to plow and everything. They're, of course, not any trouble to bees at all. So this also, to me, is a good example of how we as humans have always lived in a biological system that feeds us. There are thousands of earthworms underneath those kale plants. There's mustard. There's fruit trees. This is a system full of creatures, and they all spin off a little bit of food for human beings. That picture of the bee yard in Jamaica, I'm just going to zip back to it real quick. I just want to point out that one. These trees all around here have been selected by a quail. There are banana trees, guinea trees, mango trees, fruit called um, knees fruit and soursop and sweet sop, all kinds of fruit. And then there's a lot of these weeds, you pull them up and they have big tubers on them. They're taro and manioc and yams and there's so these people have no money but they eat really well they eat fresh natural produce organic basically every day in the morning we get up go out and look around and figure out do we got enough for the day now we we'll pull up some roots and chop some bananas you can eat plantains you can eat fried green bananas eat the fresh one the ripe ones is dessert basically and pretty soon we got the day's worth of food and it didn't take long so it's a great, a great way to live. Um, questions? Just, I think that was it for the pictures. Yeah. Okay. Is the cashew pretty popular? There are cashews. There's cacao, fruit chocolate. There's a lot of things, and I feel like they should try to grow more chocolate and make a little chocolate factory. There's, there's no infrastructure to make money there, but there's a lot of, there's no reason why they shouldn't be a very wealthy nation. Yeah, small farmers can do really well there. And beekeepers, so the Rastafarians are, they have a very strict diet. They're vegan and they don't eat sugar. So a lot of them go into being honey, raised bees because they, they feel it's okay to eat honey. You know that when you eat honey, it comes into your blood very slowly and you get slightly elevated blood sugar and it goes back to normal. When you eat sugar, you get high blood sugar. And during that time when you have high blood sugar, that's when your body's fighting really hard to make insulin and that's what's stressing you to become diabetic. And then you wind up, your body starts taking it out in your liver and it, turning it into glycogen and it pulls calcium out of your blood to do that. So that's what causes tooth problems and bone problems because the sugar takes calcium out of your bones and teeth to help you make sugar into glycogen. And then you wind up with low blood sugar because it overshoots and then slowly gets back to normal. So honey is much more healthy for you than sugar. And so the Rastafarians have come to the conclusion that we shouldn't be eating sugar and they really came out of a rebellion against slavery and so their thing was we're not going to buy stuff from the slave owners. We're not going to buy plastic gadgets. They call clothes made out of polyester gas rags. Um, so they don't believe in, in artificial, you know, try to reduce the use of plastic as much as possible. And um, so they have become very important in Jamaican. There's, most Jamaicans are not Rastafarians. You know, you can tell who are because of the, they believe that they shouldn't have they believe that you're going to have to pay for things and that you can pay for your physical beauty by getting dreadlocks and not trying to have fancy nice hair and that that will maybe get you better health. It's like making a deal, so to speak, right? So he's like, look, we'll trade in our nice hair for health, good health or whatever. So, you know, but they are, they're very respected in Jamaica and 
they are so often are also very healthy. They live long lives. They're very muscular, thin, you know, um, very healthy people. They have a fruit in Jamaica called Aki, and it's their national fruit. It's a tall tree. It makes honey for bees when it blooms. It blooms intermittently throughout the year, and it makes these pear-shaped fruits that are hard, and they split open when they get ripe. And there's three big black pits that appear in the splits, and this yellow or white kind of rubbery stuff all around the black pits, and you eat the yellow rubbery stuff. You stir fry it, and it tastes for all the world like scrambled eggs to me, and it's also very high in protein. So that is how you can be a vegetarian in Jamaica, by eating cashews and aki, and, um, and get the protein you need. Bees need, of course, a variety of protein. Well, we've shown, and now with you know, Dr. Um, Gordy, the Paramount Almond guys, he's showing that bees have, we, in modern cultures, we wind up sticking them with one type of pollen. It's really bad for bees. Also, bees use a fungus on their bodies that helps them preserve pollen. When they go and gather pollen, pollen has a lot of fatty acids. And the fatty acids can go rancid, like, oil or butter, right? And so if the bees bring it in, they pack it in little pellets on their back leg, they find their way to the cells around the brood where they're going to need the protein because the brood is what is, needs the most protein to build their bodies. They kick it off into those cells and another bee comes in and regurgitates a little honey on it to make it acidic. And then she rams it with her head and flattens it out. So you can see when you take those pollen cells apart, the little layers like strata of different colors of pollen that each bee brought in. And then they work that fungus into the pollen. And that fungus is acidophilic. It likes the acid environment. It stabilizes the fatty acids. And it, there's a pollen coat around the germ inside the pollen cell. And our digestion, nor the bee's digestion, can crack it. But the fungus cracks it. And it stabilizes the fatty acids inside it. So you wind up with a much more digestible and a much more healthy product after the bees have preserved it in the hive. So I eat bee pollen pretty regularly, but I eat it when I find a good comb of it. I eat it in the comb instead of buying the loose pellets. You could put a pollen trap on a tub or hive. It would be a simple matter of plugging up the entrance, putting a hole in the bottom, setting it on top of a regular nice pollen trap, and then the bees would come up through the pollen trap into the top of our hive, and you could trap pollen. But I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather deal with comb pollen myself. And um, also then, you can imagine what happens if you spray almond flowers in full bloom with a fungicide. Now the fungus, now the pollen that they're bringing in kills the fungus on their bodies that would be wanting to preserve the pollen. So that's one of the reasons the almond growers didn't understand that fungicides kill bees. Because bees need fungus. And in the end, we're all, like our bodies are full of fungus. And another interesting thing, I took a composting workshop, and there was a man from, and this was a woman who was advocating biological compost. How to enhance good fungus and bacteria in your compost, as opposed to chemical like carbon nitrogen ratios. A man from Costa Rica came that works for Dole, the big company that sells bananas. He said, you know, we're, we're losing the battle with a fungus that we call Cicatoga negra. And we're spraying, now half of the money we use in producing bananas is a fungicide. And we can't kill this fungus. It's, it's killing our trees. And we're going to lose bananas pretty soon as a crop. And she said, you know, it's the fungicide that is causing the Cicatoga negra because you've killed the beneficial fungus. And soil should be a biological um, system with good fungus that actually stick into the roots of the trees and grow with them. And the tree feeds the fungus, the mycorrhizal fungus, and the fungus absorbs nutrients and feeds the trees. And, that, and the fungus defends the tree from other fungus. So we are going to have to go to your place in Costa Rica and figure out how to purge the fungicide. Figure out where to get healthy soil 
and grow the good fungus. And we've got to just, it's going to be a big project. So that's kind of, it's sort of the same thing. How do we reduce toxins in beekeeping? We're going to learn how to reduce toxins in banana growing and alpha and almonds, obviously, and on down the line. And I'm kind of, that's the reason I want to be in California at this point, because that's where I see the shift being able to be pushed in a good direction. I mean, where you're going to see it in New Mexico is here in Las Cruces, because you have big, powerful, like you have people producing onion seed here. And then seed needs bees for pollination. The honey that onions make doesn't have any onion flavor either. So I hear it's really good. I've never had it. But there are onion producer, onion seed producers in this area, as I understand. And they use bees for pollination. There are organic cotton growers in here. I've met one. I can't remember his name. I think it was Mr. Hernandez. I can't remember. And at the he, at the meeting he was at, he said, we use the acidon treatment for weeds in our in our uh, fields. And everybody said, I thought you were organic, because that sounds like a chemical, right? And he said, well, that's the way we would say asadon, hope. And, we, and there's no resistance. Because that's another thing. Roundup is a common herbicide, right? Monsanto recently asked for 2,4-D ready crops to be approved. 2,4-D is the active ingredient in Agent Orange. What is the active ingredient in Agent Orange from Vietnam? Very carcinogenic. It will hurt farm workers. Farm workers opposed the approval, but Monsanto's insisted it had to have it because it has billions of dollars invested in Roundup and Roundup Ready crops, and it isn't working. Weeds have become so resistant to Roundup that it doesn't work anymore. So they want to kill those weeds with 2,4-D, and then maybe they can keep using Roundup for a while. The problem is we've already been through this as beekeepers. We used Apistan, and then we went to Kumafas, for that exact reason. And then we wound up with bees that were resistant to both. So soon there'll be weeds that are resistant to Roundup and to working. In the meantime, we're poisoning everything else and ourselves. So it's obvious that we need to stop the poison. And this is happening like in Texas. So there's, you know, we used to think of the organic movement as sort of left wing or hippie, right? But in Texas, you've got very clearly, you know, church going Christian people saying, we got to get the toxins out of Texas. We've got to stop the GMOs that God didn't mean for the world to be soaked in poison. And so, you know, it's like everybody's coming to that conclusion from the left and the right and, and the Muslims. I, I, I see Muslims saying, we've got to stop using poison on our bad crops here in Syria or Jordan. So it's a worldwide movement. And I see, I wrote to Dr. Eric Musson a few months ago who was in charge of bee research at the University of California, Davis. Okay. And I said, we need to be researching the production of alternative hives like Tabar hives and Ware, and we need to be researching mite resistance. And he wrote back to me and he said, Tom Seeley is a bee researcher up in New York who proved that the feral bees were mite resistant. And so he wrote back to me and he said, well, there may be a few incidences like Tom Seeley's bees up in New York where bees can survive without our chemical protection. But for the most part, we have such virulent pests and parasites these days that bees can't live without our protection. And we have tons of beekeepers right here in this state that have pr proven that to be wrong for many years. I've not used any chemical protection in my beehives for 20 years. And they're fine. As a matter of fact, they're thriving. So that's not true. And, but Eric is retiring, and Elena Nenius is taking over, and there's a see. Lots of hope on the horizon. Um, we're really about out of time. If anybody has a burning question, maybe more of a how-to or whatever, we're happy to. Okay. Yes. Do you think that this revolutionary concept of doing less instead of more is going to get to the people, the the big money interest in the intensive monoculture and so on? Is that, yeah, is that it, filtering? it's going to have to. It's it's going to be doing. It's going to be doing something different. It's not less or more necessarily. It's going to be figuring out the biology, no. and we're going to have to work it. And, but we're going to make money, and we're going to we'll grow food, and or we're going to starve. You know, to be quite frank, 
when there gets to be not enough pollinators to pollinate the crops, then there's not going to be almonds, peaches, pear, fruits and vegetables, or alfalfa. Do you think we need to reach that crisis moment before uh, we turn around to the method, I, the method farming? I, I hope not. I hope we're smart enough. It, it doesn't take any, you know, re reading the future ability, like mystical ability, to say, well, we're kind of in trouble now. And the bees have made that clear to us. And, but other creatures should be. Like, we should be really concerned about earthworms right now. What do we do as farmers? That are, how is that impacting earthworms? If we can keep earthworms healthy, we can keep ourselves healthy. It's our soil that is probably the, the basis of our life in many ways. Right? And the bees have helped us see that, but we need to see ourselves as integrated with nature. And how do we enhance that? But it's still going to be lots of work. It's not going to be like, oh, we're just going to sit and wait for the apple to fall in our hand. We're going to have to get out there and change things. And we have people like Paul Stamets using mushrooms to get rid of toxins. He's going to where they spill diesel fuel and finding fungus that denature and turn the diesel fuel into fertilizer. So nature is on our side if we just let it. But we have to we have to open up our eyes and see how we've kind of put it's been so easy to go out and get a can of rain and just, there, we took care of that wasp or that bug on our garden and, and it's, it was too easy. And we didn't realize that when we did that, we were doing it to ourselves. And now we do. We learn from our mistakes. Either the thoughtful way or the hard way. Right? I don't know. Um, just quickly, one last thing. If we come away from this saying beekeepers are impacted by pesticides, they kill our bees, then the last thing we want to do is say, but never mind what I'm putting in my behalf. Right? We're pretty hypocritical to ask agriculture not to use pesticides if we feel that we need to use them, and we don't need to use them. Bees are mite resistant. There are disease resistant bees. I've tried to put combs full of American fowlbrood in a healthy hive to transfer the disease. I was a honeybee inspector at the time. That was like everything the book tells you never to do. And I could not get the disease to transfer to the bees. Now, the man that inspired me to do that claimed that the bacteria didn't actually cause the disease. I don't know, but I know that the bacteria can't cause the disease in disease-resistant bees. And we just need to learn how to keep bees without antibiotics, and it's pretty easy. You breed from your survivors, and you keep the old combs out of your brood nest. You put them out in the honey part, eventually you harvest honey out of them, get rid of them, and leave the bees live in relatively new beeswax, and it's healthier for the bees. So there's things we can learn how to do, and bees we can breed with, to allow us not to need pesticides. Uh, how old do you think a comb is when it's time to get rid of it? Dr. J. Cox's research indicated three to five years or when you hold it to the light and you can't see light shining through it. Uh -huh. And so because every cocoon is stuck in there. A bee is born in there, the cocoon spins a cocoon. They leave the cocoon in there, clean it. Another bee is born in there. She defecates on the bottom of the cell before she spins a cocoon. That's stuck in there. And over time, those cells get thick and full of bacteria and fungus. So by culling those old combs, you get rid of that bacteria load, and that greatly enhances the bee's health in the hive. And nowadays, old combs are also often have absorbed toxins from the the environment or that the beekeeper put in there. So another reason to keep moving the wax through the hive, because they just keep accumulating the toxins. And beeswax can make you as much honey, as much money as your honey if you know how to use it wisely. Making salves, lip balms, candles, soap. What do you do? Just pull the water, your old comb out and replace it with uh, just a plate? Well, see, so the top of our hive, you just have a bar. Yeah. And so if the old comb has brood in it, I move it back to the back of the brood nest, and then maybe even one more back, and then the bench of the brood will hatch out of it. And then where, where I move it out, I might put an empty top bar in there, and they'll build a new comb. Or I'll find a clean comb from my honey area to put in there, so they can empty it and put brood into it. And then eventually, the comb that had brood in it, that's old, will fill with honey. Then I crush it, squeeze out the honey, melt the wax out of it, and then I, the top bar goes right back. Top bars are cheap and simple. The thing about top bar hives is, 
they, they require a little more management because you, you don't want them to start building the chrome crooked. But they're, I can build top of our, I build them out of those plastic blue barrels from the dairies that have teeth dip in them, cut it long ways, put top bars, 24 inch top bars in that case. And I, that was costing eight bucks for the barrel, so four bucks per hive. And I was using scrap lumber for my top bars. And it was quick, it took me, you know, all of an hour to build the whole hive, including cutting the top bars. And so they're simple. And that's what the Jamaicans like about them is they're cheap and simple because they're going out to the trees with chainsaws, cutting boards out of the trees, all them home, and making their own frames and boxes. And it takes them a lot of work. And the top right is a lot less work. What did you do to make those metal stands? I had my dad, I just bought rebar and my dad made it. Uh -huh. My dad just passed away, so I'm no longer able to do that. But um, they're just anything to keep the hive sort of tabletop height, easy to work, yeah. and off the ground. You don't want them down on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a newbie question. Water. Uh, my, I have t two top bar hives, and I have the plastic tub where the segregated down to the water, pebbles, gravel, and they don't like that. They go up to my dog's metal bucket, oh, and when I have it filled all the way to the brim, they get up on there, and then when the water goes down a little, they fall in. Is there a trick to what kind of water they like? Yeah, that's, you think that they have it. So where is the good the feeder, like right in front of the hive? Yeah, and, and the, that's and the the dog bucket's way up the yeah, but, but that Actually, right in front of the hive is where they throw their trash, and they don't like it, water source there. They want it off a ways, maybe on the south side of something where it would be a little bit shaded and cooler in the summer, and they don't want it right in front of the hive. Okay, how much of a distance? Um, it can be 30, 40 feet. Okay. It, 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 at least 10 feet. And the other thing is, you, if you put just a little bit of... Um, lemongrass or something? Well, there's that on, the, on yours, to put lemongrass there, or a little bit of sodium salt in the water where, the, where you want them. And a little tiny bit of um, Epsom salts in the water you don't want, not enough to bother your dog. It only takes like less than 1%. And this was Dr. James Nye worked on this out of the University of California, San Diego. That tends to repel the bees. They like cable salt, sodium salt, but they don't like magnesium or um, potassium salt. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so that can help. But you definitely don't want the water right in front of the beehive. Well, this is about, you know, 20 feet away. Oh, yeah. But... It should have been okay. You know, their bees can be kind of cranky. Like, my friends that have the bees in Austin, they have this pond to feed their bees, and they have a hot tub, and of course the bees are all at their hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to like uh, where I'm starting new seeds, where there's still a lot of moist soil. Yeah. They seem to like that. So right. should I be putting an area over here that has a lot of wet? They love, soil? Yeah, they love vegetation that's so dripping wet or really wet, sandy soil. And they don't usually like open water. You know, obviously they're drowning in it. But, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think it's time to go. we got to get to Albuquerque, so. <laughs> thank you so much.